a CBC color presentation. Yes, there's something to think about. If not a string about, call out in chorus or quietly hum. Of a lion that's in young, with some talent, a still and some, calling the foreign and taking the power. From the bank to the private to the Alberta Highland, from the prairie the bay to our carryover flowers, from the sound of my royal tide, unto the paradise, something to think about, this land of ours. Yes, there's something to think about. been a soft life, actually. It really has been really soft, you know. Times have changed outside, but out here, here, it's never changed much. And now I'm getting old now, but if I had the same thing to do over, I'd do the same damn thing again. A soft life? Only Pan Phillips would call it that. And if you didn't know him any better, you might even believe it. But if you want the real truth, you'd have to saddle up a horse in Cornell, British Columbia, and then ride west for 200 miles into the edge of the Coast Mountains. And there you will find Pan Phillips, where he's been for 35 years. There's no electricity, no tap water, and if he doesn't shoot straight, no groceries. Pan Phillips will beat you at poker, tell you atrocious lies, drink all your liquor, and then, if he still likes you, he might even take you on a cattle drive. Perhaps the last real cattle drive in North America. Back in 1934, Pan Phillips and his partner, Richmond Hobson, came north from Wyoming, looking for new grasslands. They crossed the mountains into little-known country north of British Columbia's Chilcotin Plateau. And here, beside a meandering stream, they built the home ranch. Years later, Hobson wrote a book about their experiences, and he called it grass beyond the mountains. <laughs> the home ranch is still a couple of days' ride from the nearest road. But the blessings of civilization have not entirely passed Pan Phillips by. For several years, he's had a tractor, for example. And it quite often works, at least as long as his flying friends bring in gasoline. Betty Phillips does her grocery shopping regularly, once or twice a year. And in between, she has to make do with venison, moose, and vegetables she grows herself. But the airplanes have helped her too. They bring in bacon, coffee, sugar, even store-bought bread. say that a good cowboy is a cheaper with his brains knocked out. <laughs> but <laughs> I guess you got to know a little bit. Too. But the uh, one thing I'll say about this, living back in the bush, you're not in for, uh, you're not in raising cattle for the money. You don't make no money. It's just uh, you, you get by and it's just a uh, life that's, well, I like and I guess quite a few other guys like it, otherwise they wouldn't be in the business, but it's not, uh, we will never be millionaires and we're not looking forward to it, that's for sure.
Long before the morning sun has burned away the frost, they're on their way. It's October again, and Pan Phillips is about to begin his 31st British Columbia cattle drive. It takes more than cow hands to run a cattle drive. Someone has to ride the grub wagon, make camp, cook, and do a dozen other jobs that have nothing to do with herding cattle. This time it will be Diana, Pan's youngest daughter. There will be no thundering hoofbeats and clouds of dust on this cattle drive. To prevent the cattle from losing weight, Pan and his daughter Gail and son Bobby will walk the herd slowly all 110 miles of the way. It will take nine or ten days, but the cattle will arrive as fat and healthy as when they left the ranch. It's a slow trip, but under more pressing circumstances, Pan has ridden the nearly 200 miles into Cornell in just three days. As he explains, though, I was dry. Until three years ago, Betty Phillips always drove the wagon and cooked for the drive, often with several young children in tow. Good luck. Then, a fall from a horse and later arthritis made the trip so difficult that she finally had to give it up. See, I haven't ridden a horse now for about 10 years. That's a long time, you know. You take my terms like this now. I always say, well, I don't care to go on the drive, but the time comes, I feel pretty blue with me all these. So, miss it, you know. The first day is always the worst. It's timber country all the way for 16 miles, and the cattle seem determined to get off the trail and lose themselves in spruce thickets. They want to go home, and it takes a lot of whistling and yelling and maybe even a bit of swearing to change their minds. It could be three weeks before Pan gets back to the ranch, but he doesn't worry about leaving Betty at home alone. She can look out for herself better than most men. In fact, one winter when her children were still very young, she ran the ranch alone in temperatures of 60 below while Pan was away. Annie got back home after 13 days. And Betty was sure, for once, my wife was sure glad to see me home. <laughs> She'd been working but she hard. made out pretty good. She'd been she, she fed the cattle and cut the wood all right. And I had no complaints. I didn't borrow out too much. She fed too much hay, of course. But. But, uh, you know, a person always watch the hay pile back in this country. It's not bad to run out of grub, but it's hell to run out of hay. Out here you make out on your own, or you don't make out at all. There's no way to get a message to the world outside, except to climb on a horse and take it out yourself. Oh, uh, you know, a lot of people say, what would happen if you got sick? Well, you don't get sick back there, you just die. <laughs> to Pan, the home ranch isn't isolated at all. In fact, it's the center of the universe. But some of his acquaintances haven't seen it that way. Well, uh, it's really not a country for women. The old saying is hell on horses and women both. <laughs> but uh, I had this woman, a woman and married her in a I had to bring her back, so I just put a rope around her neck and let her in, and she had to come. <laughs> she didn't stay very long, though. <laughs> she, I don't know, she didn't seem to like it. Her views and mine were different, you see.
In her 24 years, Diana has been on more than 20 drives, beginning as an infant bedded down in the wagon while her mother drove. Now she can cook her cowboy as well as any man on the drive. And when she has to, she can be tough, too. Three years ago, the horses galloped down a mountain and rolled the wagon over on top of it. She was unconscious for four hours and ended up in hospital. But today she drives as if nothing had happened. There are always a few wise old cows that want to cut out for home during the night. And just for company, they'll take half the herd with them. Pan knows their ways, though, and whenever he can find an old corral along the trail, he shuts them in for the night. As ranchers go today, Pan Phillips is just a little guy. The 60 head in this year's drive would hardly supply the cookhouse on some of British Columbia's really big ranches. Pan used to run a thousand head, and there were often more than 200 in the drive. Now, though, he's taking it easier because, as he says, it doesn't matter how many cattle you've got. There are always too many when you have to feed them, and too few when you go to sell them. No one on a cattle drive expects to dine in elegance. What's wanted is solid food, and plenty of it. After all, even the most inventive cook can only do so much with a haunch of venison. thinks of the cattle drive as his annual picnic, just a romp across the countryside. Real work to him is freighting supplies in the dead of winter. With horses and sleigh, he used to cross the mountains 135 miles to the town of Bella Coola, down on Tidewater. Along the trail, he'd meet with trappers and other packers, and at night, they'd jam themselves and their supplies into some tiny cabin to escape the bitter cold. But I remember my friend James Jack, which is dead now, he had two boxes of apples and he didn't want to freeze them nationally. And so he put them against, right against the stove in his cabin. Somebody was up all night keeping this fire going. And the next morning, James looked at his apples. Jesus Christ, he said, one side is cooked, the other side is froze. <laughs> and which is true. And went out and they had a thermometer on the north side of the of the cabin, it registered 66 below with a little wind, about six or seven miles an hour wind blowing, and you can imagine what that, what that is and when it's that cold. Cattle don't like to be kept waiting in the morning. So if you're not out early to start them moving, they'll head out on their own, 
usually in the wrong direction. This means that Diana is left behind to break camp by herself. Before noon, she'll catch up to the herd and drop a lunch off for Pan and Bobby and Gail. Then she'll trot ahead, set up a new camp, and have supper waiting when the drive gets in. It's a long day. And so the miles slip by. 16 to Tasha Lake, 10 to Antoine's, 12 to Sandy Man Place. Before long, time is all but forgotten. And the days are marked only by the passing of old camps and stopping places grown familiar for more than 30 years of use. Except for trips to town with the cattle drive, or to take in the annual stampede, Bobby Phillips has spent most of his 13 years at the home ranch. He hunts and fishes, and for several years he has had a trap line of his own, and he's already very sure that this is what he wants to do with his life. One year he did stay in town to go to school, but he never got over being homesick for the ranch. better know how to live off the land. But you also have to be prepared for nature to have a meal or two at your expense. Over the years, wolves and grizzly bears have killed several hundred head of Pan's cattle. In one bad stretch of just five years, bears took 75 head. And more than once, they put the run on Pan, too. Coming back, I looked off a rim and about 100 feet down to the water, and there's two big bear in there fishing. Well, uh, they were having a good time fishing, and I didn't mind them eating the fish, and I thought I'd have a little fun with it, so I took a big rock, and of course, we were going to drop it on one, you see, but I missed him about two feet and hit in the rear of him, which splashed water all over him. Of course, he reared up really on the fight and thought his partner had splashed water on him, and they, they stood up like a couple of men, you know, they scared each other, but didn't dare fight, you know, arguing and growl at one another. <laughs> and uh, I thought this was quite a joke, you see, and I took around for another rock to heave down on him, and the dog heard all this commotion. He come and looked over, then he started barking. Well, of course, they uh, looked up, and they saw standing on the rim above, and they come right up after it. The dog, he stopped to argue, but I, st I started to ride out. I mounted right away and got there, but when he got to the top, well, they, of course, the dog took after me, you see, and the bears come after the dog and me both, and of course, I couldn't go over them too fast. So the bears caught up with me, and one was right behind me, and one was right on the, on the side of me. And they were going, both going, woof, 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 woof. And the, and the rim was on the other side, down on the river, which is 100 feet drop. So where was I do but go straight ahead. So this continued on for a quarter of a mile, but I think they just wanted to scare me, which they did, really. Because they could have, actually could have slapped me over any time they wanted to.
When there's trouble on the drive, it comes suddenly and without warning. And this is how it happened with the horses. During the night, some sound or smell out in the meadow frightened them. And three of the five horses snapped their picket ropes and galloped away. And so the search began, with Pan and Diana riding the two remaining horses, and Bobby on foot. They combed the countryside for miles around. Two of the missing horses were the team for the wagon, and until they could be found, the drive was stalled. For two days, they hunted every hill and valley for miles around. Then, when they had all but given up hope, Diana came across some tracks. Following them back into the hills, she found the horses hidden in a heavily wooded draw more than 10 miles from camp. Let's harness up and get out of here. More than a hundred miles, the drive passes through countryside that is deserted, except for a few Indian families. When fur prices were high in the 1920s and 30s, people did live here. A fur buyer and several families stayed here at Cluscus. And in the spring and fall, more people came to sing and feast and attend church services conducted by a traveling priest. Eventually, though, fur prices fell and everyone moved away. Now the only visitors are the swallows that come to nest each summer in the empty church. Yeah. 
A few more days, a few more camps, and the drive will come out of the bush to meet the road near Nazco. Trucks will be waiting there to haul the cattle the rest of the way into town. The drive will be over, and for Pan it could be his last. The home ranch is for sale, and when the drive comes this way next year, there may be a new man in charge. Gail and Diana will be going to live in town for the winter, and Bobby will stay on with Pan and Betty when they move into a new cabin on a lake near the ranch. Pan will be sorry to see the ranch pass out of the family, but his children are going their separate ways, and even if he could persuade them to stay, he doubts if things would work out very well. Well, some of my kids like it, you see. My... Actually, most of the kids actually do like it. Just that they can't get along with the old man. <laughs> Go! 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 Anybody uh, can stand this? It's a soft light. All right. 